Hello, everyone, and welcome to Med Hedosner Podcast, episode 16. I'm your host, Vic Aslanian. As uh, always, I'm joined by my co host, Mike Balian, where we discuss our great Armenian history, covering different people, eras, and topics. How are you, Mike? Fantastic. That yeah. was another uh, wonderful greeting p- by yourself. Yeah. We should come up with a different version, maybe. I don't know, man. Keep the energy up, dude. All right. Um, Today's topic is going to be the Orontid dynasty. Or the Uh, Yervanduni. Yervanduni, yeah. Uh, But uh, before we get into it, uh, we want to talk about a couple of things. Um, Last week, we were on the... Well, not last week. The week before that, right? We were on... Yeah, Yeah, we were on on the... uh, the Wise Nights podcast, uh, we did put that a portion of it up. I uh, hope you guys listened to it and liked it. Um, and you can always search for the Wise Nights podcast and listen to the full episode on their platform. You can also watch us on the YouTube. Again, search for Wise Nuts. And um, that was great. We had a lot of fun. That yeah. was an interesting three and a half hours. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> three three and the least. Hours. Uh, Three hopefully, and a half hours. Yeah. Hopefully you guys learned something about us. Um, you know, um, it was, like we said, it's it's a very open, you know, show. We talk about different topics and uh, we got to share some stories about us, how we met, uh, some stuff about our past and what we're doing. So uh, we had a lot of fun. So we can't wait to, uh, in the near future, hopefully to go back for another episode and have more stories for, for you guys. Yeah, I don't know about more stories. It's going to yeah. get dangerous. Yeah. Yeah. Um, as we mentioned in episode 15, uh, we had a listener by Avo Vezirian, uh, who had some interesting questions for us, and we promised to answer them f- uh, for him, basically. Uh, first, I want to correct something. I did butcher his last name because it was spelled with a W, so I think I said Vezirian, but he corrected her. It's Vezirian. It's, it's a V. Um, so, Avo, my apologies to you. And um, and he also kind of shared something small story about his last name, which I kind of want to, you know, he gave me the okay to share with everybody else, because this is um, this is something that almost every Armenian has some kind of a story that's tied to their last name or something that happened during the genocide. So and uh, this is what he said. He said, my last name is pronounced Vazirian, but switched to what with the W, I guess, Wazirian in Lebanon, where my parents are from. There's no V in Arabic. I believe it's Turkified last name from uh, Varchabedian or maybe Nahararian. Unfortunately, I will live and die without ever knowing. My grandfather, with his father and brother, have escaped the Turks during the attack on Marash, killing his mother and two sisters, burning them in the church with other Armenians. My grandfather used to cry time to time, whispering, uh, Mama. Um, there, there, sorry. Um, they were eventually uh, rescued by French army and uh, taken to Aleppo, Syria. My father later escaped the regime in Syria, hiding in a chicken truck to Lebanon, basically. Which landed him, uh, him and his family in a brutal 25-year civil war, Armenian destiny, perpetual pain and suffering. After the war, they immigrated to Canada when I was 10 years old. So, another story, you know. Yeah. Um, um it's not easy hearing any of these stories. Yeah. It never is. It really isn't. Yeah. I mean, you know, I've heard so many stories like this, even from my own uh, grandparents and grand grandparents. So, uh, but Avo, thank you for sharing that. And, um, you know, we're, we're glad that, you know, they were able to survive and, and, you know, um, I guess, uh, what's the word to, uh, persevere, to persevere. Yep. And, uh, because of that, you're here and, and, you know, you're, you're going to continue the lineage and, and with your children and so forth, you know? So Avo's question was about the Figian cap. Uh, if you guys don't know what the figging cap is, if you do, if you Google it, it's a type of cap that has been uh, worn by um, by the French, uh, by a lot, lot of the cultures, mm-hmm. and it symbolizes freedom. Yeah. Um, so um, his cu- question was, what is the connection with the Armenian history of the 
Mithraic religion in ancient Armenia. As we know, the cap was worn by Mithra in the Roman version, slaying a bull. Is this the same god? And Mithra, or Meher, are the same god? There's a second question to that, and he also says, Why is it called the Phrygian cap? We know the connection of the Phrygians with the Armenians, which is contested by some as being not accurate, but depicted by the Herodotus in his chronicles as being the same people. Is there a connection there? Third question. <laughs> um, the cap is also seen worn by French, uh, French revolutionaries. Uh, what's the connection there with Armenians? It is seen in France as a sign of liberty and freedom. Why? Well, Avo, we, um, we did, you know, uh, do some research. We also had a conversation with, uh, with, uh, Gevork to kind of get a better, um, I guess, understanding, understanding yeah. and to provide the right answer for you. So, um, Mike has all the questions, all the answers, I should say your questions so go ahead wow i feel really special i there just want to let you know i'm not the one who did the research well we kind of did the research on this together yeah. and figured this out but anyway moving on yes mithraism can definitely be traced to armenia the earliest attestation of the god mithra comes from mitanni a number of scholars believe that mithraism was spread throughout the roman empire after tiridates the first or tertat the first the king of armenia who visited Rome in 66 AD and established a priesthood there. The cap is indeed Mithraic. The reason is that sometimes also called Phrygian is because the Phrygians also wore it. But the key word here is also. We are not sure why and how it is labeled Phrygian when it could just be as well, if not more convincingly, called Armenian cap. In light of the points we just made, Armenians are depicted wearing such caps in relief from at least the first half of the first millennium BC. The French also adopted the cap because it symbolized freedom. If we are correct on the research, it was connected to Spartacus, who was a Thracian and wore the cap also during his uprising against the Romans at the time of the reign of Tigran the Great. So in early modern history, the cap symbolized Spartacus and his men who wore those caps, which as we said, were worn by Armenians and also other peoples in early periods. So we hope there this you answer your, answers yeah. your question. Yeah, yeah. That that's that's the I guess the best way we could answer this and ask more questions, people. Yeah, yeah. But this so, was this yeah, was it was go. it was a fun little bit of research that Vic and I did. Yeah, you know. So and and Gevork obviously helped us with this. So yes. thank you to Gevork. Thank uh, you, Gevork. Appreciate it as always. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, um, that's pretty much it as far as you know. Um opening part of the show so like i said our main topic today is the orontid dynasty now uh some of the research that we did um you know there's a lot of articles and um we want to like in the beginning we kind of want to introduce you what the dynasty is about and then we'll get dive into the um you know because when we do the research there's a lot of falsification so we're gonna also kind of talk about some stuff from other historians that debunk the theories that um, somehow the Oriented dynasty was connected to Persians or, you know, Syrians or anything of that sort. But there was a connection. We'll, we'll get into that. Well, there yeah. was, you know, there was yeah. an interesting connection with the Persians of yeah. the time that um, more or less points to debunking some yeah. of these uh, historical narratives. Yeah. So to begin, uh, the Oriented dynasty, also known by the Armenian native name as the Yervan Duni, um, that's actually Yervan is an Armenian name, yeah, you know, yeah. was a hereditary dynasty that ruled Armenia from the 6th to the 2nd century BC. A branch of the Orontids ruled as kings of Sophene and Comagene until the 1st century AD. One of the early capitals of the Yervan Dunis was the Armenian city of Aramvir and subsequently the city of Yervan Dashat. Orontes, or Yervan IV, reigned from 220 to 200 BCE. According to Moses Khorenazi, Orontes IV reigned for 20 years. He was the last king of the Orontid dynasty, who was the son of the king Arsames Orontid of the Armenian kingdom of the Comagen. Actually, it's pronounced, I think it's Kama, right? Kama? Comagen? Yeah. Yeah. Comagen? Kama? 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 Yeah, Kama. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <coughs> 
During his reign, the religious center of Bagaran, which is the adobe of gods, was established. The high priest of the kingdom of Armenia during this time was the brother of Orontos IV, Yervaz. Statues of Armazat, Anahit, and Vahagan were erected in the temples of the holy city. I guess it's uh, keep it in the family, right? Of course, it always is, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. It's the way it works. Um, Orontes IV, or Yervan IV, also founded a shrine dedicated to Armenian national deity, Mithra or Mir. In the oriented capital of Armavir, which was embellished with a golden statue of the sun god Mithra upon a quadriga, which is a four-horse chariot. I really like that word. Yeah. Quadriga. quadriga. I like it. Very powerful. Very. Due to the change of the current of the river Yeras, um, which started to bypass the capital city of Armavir, Orontes IV, at the junction point of the rivers, Ahurian and Yeras, established a new city of Yervandashat, which he named after himself. Of course. <laughs> Who else is going to name it after? I am king. I shall name thee Yervandashat. <laughs> yep, there you That's go. That's the way it works. Yes. I mean, dude, when you're a king, you just do what you want. I mean, what is he going to name it after? His dog? I, yeah, I mean, I, you, I, hey, hey, <laughs> hey, 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 you never know. You never know. Okay. King Antiochus III of the Seleucid Empire in, instigated a revolt against King Orontes IV. Strabo, our good uh, historian, yeah. Greek historian and uh, you know, philosopher friend, noted that Orontes IV was succeeded by King Artachias or Artaches I, the Merciful, who was also an Orontid, who established a new royal dynasty, the Arta Artaches or Artachias, which was named after him. Yeah. There it is again. There it is. <laughs> named after I mean, him. Look, it's just the way it is, right? Yeah. We just have to accept it at well, this point. Th the thing is, um, I, I, you know, I want to mention this. We should really work on not, you know, I know we mentioned the English version, the writing. We should really concentrate on saying it in the Armenian version. Yeah. So people actually understand that this is how it's pronounced. Yeah. Orontid, you know? for, for any of our international audience, non-Armenian audience, Orontid is the English pronunciation, but in, you know, in, in our history, yeah. we learned it as Yervanduni, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, so, um, in the first half of the 6th century BC, the Orontid, or Ervanduni, as it used to be known, dynasty was founded by Orontes, or Ervand, or Arwand, Erwand, the first, and ruled the kingdom of Armenia until the 2nd century BC, succeeded by the Artashes dynasty. The most notable king of the dynasty was Tigranes, or Tigran, of Orontid, who succeeded Orontes I and also reigned in the 6th century BC. Khorenazi, or Mofsas Khorenazi, the father of Armenian history, for his valor, um, Tigran Orontid's valor, yeah. described him as, and I quote, mighty, renowned, and victorious among the great kings, and listed Tigran, or Tigranes, as the third most distinguished leader in Armenian history. Yeah, and and we're going to talk about him more because from the research we were doing, uh, it seemed like, you know, obviously there was a, a lot more kings during the during the Yervanduni dynasty, yeah. but uh, it seems like he was the most, I guess, I don't want to say powerful, influential. but influential mm -hmm. king. Um, one thing I want to note that the uh, Orontids were actually one of the great houses of the 90 uh, Confederation of Armenia, which uh, was in the second millennium BC, who successfully actually fought off the Assyrian in, in, insurgent. Um, and um, several Armeno Hittite kings bore the name of Yervanduni, basically. Yeah. Um, and, and, um, the thing is, we were gonna do an episode about the uh, the Nairi Confederation, but there's so there's, little there's nothing. information. There's, there's nothing, nothing out there. Yeah, there really uh, isn't. So, but yeah, th there is definitely evidence that the Orontids were basically the Nairi Confederation. Yeah, most of yeah. most of the stuff that we did find, which was supposed to precede these this episode, yeah. um, was from other cultures and their history yeah. and it really wasn't enough it was just more like touching points yeah, yeah you know yeah so it was it just wasn't it would have been a five minute podcast <laughs> <laughs> hello and good night yes see you next episode yeah um now what we want to actually do is we want to talk about um there was a historian named by martyros uh kavugian 
Um, and he wrote a book called Armenia, Subartu, and Sumar. And uh, we're going to read something from that book that he wrote, which is basically debunking the whole Persian connection of the Orontid dynasty, because there is a lot of false information that says that, you know, the Orontids were actually Persians. Yeah. Um, so, you know, Martyros, uh, and this is what he writes. Uh, it is clear that the name Yervan or Yervanduni is a family name, but the problem of its ethnic identity remains obscure because of the scarcity and vagueness of available information, and it continues to be the subject of controversy. He goes on, some authors attributing and decisive significance to the marriage relations that the Yervandunis established in later years with Achaemenians, and particularly having in view the erroneous attempts of searching the origin of the name Yervan in the Persian language, are inclined to ascribe Persian origin to this dynasty. So, yeah, it's I, I, how do you make that connection? Yeah, yeah, just based, just simply based off the name. I don't understand. Yeah, anyway, it's, carry on. He continues, uh, this, however, could not be possible because after the fall of the Araratian dynasty in Armenia, which was from like 590 to 585 BC, yeah. the Yervanduni kingdom, which includes the same Araratian Uraratian territories as was in the days of the Astiagis. Uh, which was 584 to 553 BC, under the suzerainty of the Medes, not the Persians. The Medes certainly would not have placed on the throne uh, of Armenia Urartu, one of their rivals, which whom they had just conquered, or even the Persians, who also battled the Medes in three years of bloody battles under Cyrus's leadership, who eventually would overthrow the Median rule in 553 BC. So... Again, it's just the name itself, Yerevan. If that's in some sort of uh, transcripts or yeah. or some sort of writing in Persian history or whatever the case is, right? I'm I'm curious as to how they made the connection that this was a, you know, Persian possible Persian family or they, their roots were Persian. Not just that. It, I mean, he makes a good point. Like, you know, why would you know, if if you just, you know, let's say conquered a, a kingdom or took over it as as the Medes did, you know, why would you take someone from your enemy and put them on the throne? Yep. You know, that just doesn't make no no, no one in their right mind sense. would do that, right? No. You know, it doesn't make no, any it sense. Ma- so. It doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, as we see, there's quite a bit of evidence, even simple evidence. And yeah. I'm gonna kinda I'm gonna get into that next that points to a lot of that stuff i guess let's use the word loosely debunked yeah that whatever narrative that they tried to carry through isn't really necessarily the case that it's very simple to understand that even just again this is why based off of what you said you're not going to place your enemy or your somebody you conquered in yeah. the place of a throne yeah. of a territory that you control but at the same time just even the name itself, based off of our lineage, our mm-hmm. history, the yeah. words, the connections, the etymology, that even in and of itself, wait a minute, how many times have you looked at somebody's last name or or something, whether it's a Turkish last name, whether it's a Persian last name, and I don't know, 100% that person's yeah. Armenian. Oh, you know how many times it's happened to me right? where, like, yeah, it's, it, it, it has to have some sort of Armenian lineage. Armenian lineage, uh, yeah, yeah, like you said, and 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 the funny thing I've been like, uh, you know, first thing you say, are you Armenian? And they're like, no, I'm Persian. It's happened, especially with oh, yeah. Persians, it's happened yeah. so many times. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I've, I've, I mean, from even not just with Persians, but different cultures, I've, I've come across some people even throughout even Europe. Even French. Oh, you took the words out of my mouth. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Yes, that's yeah. happened to me on two occasions, actually. Yeah. Um, but um, as I'm going to mention here that there's even further evidence. Yeah. Um, so continuing some of the um, debunking of Martyros, this very uncertainty about the ethnic origin of the Ervanduni dynasty and the futile attempts of searching the etymology of the name Yervand or Ervand in the Persian language have been a major contributing factor of misunderstanding in history, distorting the circumstances of the transition of power from the Aramian to the Ervanduni dynasty in Urartu and entirely throwing off track the history of Urartu and that of subsequent periods. Yeah. There you go. Yep. 
I mean, I, I know I kept saying it over and over again, but just that name in and of itself. Yeah. I mean, you brought up a valid point. And I'm sure there's many more, but the name itself, it's not a Persian name. It doesn't come from anything from Persian roots. Nothing. Yeah. Zero. Yeah. Zip zilch. Yeah. Well, he's going to continue and he's, you know, bring some kind of an observation that and, is going to help to throw more yeah, light. And I, I, the... I want to share some yeah. of that, yeah. some of those observation, which actually throw some more light yeah. on, on the very important question. Yep. So yeah. um, let me say first that the Medes, after defeating Urartu and aiming for greater imperialistic expansions toward the interior of Asia Minor, would not have deemed it wise to place a foreigner on the throne of Urartu. Again, he, you know, we, I know we mentioned it, but again, he's emphasizing on this, that like, yeah. it doesn't uh, make sense. Yes, it doesn't make yeah. sense. It doesn't yeah. make sense on multiple accounts. Yeah. Such an act would have been extremely provocative, A, and offensive to brave and proud people of great traditions, like the Naidian people, whose mm -hmm. military assistance they would have certainly needed in the near future expansions. Now, the Naidians were known to be, I guess at the time, somewhat neutral. Yeah. But... And great warriors. Right, absolutely. But yeah. it's still, you. why would you mess with that? Why would you yeah. tinker with that? Therefore, the Medes would have placed on the throne of Urartu a prince who either was on a non was a non-direct descendant, like a yeah. relative or yeah. something of this yeah, yeah. sort, of the Urartian dynasty or belonged to one of the principal Naidian tribes that founded Uruatri and later Urartu. Yeah. Yeah. And and exactly that that right there. It's just um, you know, when when you're building an empire, you know, let's say we took over something that a yeah. land you know and and you know what are you gonna do what, are you gonna bring an enemy or a complete foreigner no you're gonna go to the leader right or or the next prince that would have been you know in the lineage to yeah. be the next king or something and made a deal with him say hey we want you but you're gonna obey our you know rules and absolutely whatever of uh, course of course yeah. i mean you can play some treachery you know, yeah. there, I'm sure people have maybe attempted in doing such things, but it just doesn't make any sense yeah. Yeah. at some point. Yeah. You know, how can you trust somebody like that? Yeah. You know? Martyros Kavukjan continues by saying, What concerns the origin of the name Yervand or Yervand, historical investigations show that his that this name, as a royal name linked with the Ervanduni family and their land, is much older than generally accepted. These investigations find that the name Edvand is derived from the Sumerian name Urbanda. Mm -hmm. This name is found in well-known Hittite inscriptions that speak about Naramsin's enemies. It occupies the 15th place in that list of kings. I yeah. guess this guy has a, had a list of kings. Yeah, I guess so. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Found so, that very interesting yeah, when we, when we yeah. came across that. Yeah, so we, we wanted to to bring this in because, again, um, as we mentioned before, when we are doing the research, there's a lot of information that you type in about Armenian dynasties and kingdoms and, and you know, somehow it's, again, this is all false information out there and we know who's doing this, um, you know, so we want to be able to de debunk this, especially to non-Armenians who listen to us to understand that, you know, we're not making this stuff up. It's 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 fact, you know, and, and for other cultures um i don't want to call them enemies but you know that are trying to falsify our history because of some kind of a political gain or whatever it is you know um not cool people well the <laughs> the, the non the non-inclusion yeah it seems like it's more non-inclusion so far what we've come across than than anything else right yeah. like i remember when we were talking about um you know the um, I forgot what episode it was where we kind of touched on Mesopotamia and how, you know, Armenians occupied that land. Just that you don't include the people in the name and who yeah. and what and how. You're just generalizing a term yeah. to just people that occupied the land between two rivers, yeah. right? So from here, we're going to talk about uh, mostly about Tigranes, um, who was, uh, you know, one of the, uh, actually, we should say Tigranes the first. Uh, not to confuse with, you know, Tigran the Great. Tigran the Great. Um, and, and the reason we're going to talk about because he was very influential during the Oriented Dynasty. So, and uh, I'm going to start by a quote from Moses Horanazi. I would like to mention these names because of their valor. Haik, Aram, Tigranes, 
but the offsprings of the courageous are in turn courageous. And those who were in between, let others call them as they please. Um, I, I'm actually, um, something about Moses Horonazi, I, or, I ordered three books of his, the Armenian version, mm-hmm. um, it's a shorter version, and then there's the long the actual book, which I'm going to attempt to read, and then there's the English version, which is, um, I forget who it was uh, translated by, but it's actually, he ends up, um, he's questioning a lot of the stuff, and he's trying to make it seem like Horonazi is you know, obviously the people know he was controversial, but uh, almost like as if he was insane. He was making all this, all this stuff, stuff up. up. Yeah. Wait, wait. So the author of the book, yeah, it was, was translated. Was as, trying to uh, like kind of question question everything that everything that Horanazi everything Horanazi wrote. Horanazi wrote. Yeah, is there is a writer Armenian? No, he's not. Really? Not. Yeah, man, I, I I should have wrote down the the, the author's name. I got to look into this one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And yeah, that's yeah, the that's, only that's, that's the really... only translation of the book that is actually the full translation, and it's not even translated properly. Which uh, that's I was talking to Gevork about that, and I was saying, you know, it's it's sad that nobody has translated the book into English properly because mm-hmm. it's it's fascinating, you know. And people like us who might not be able to read Armenian that well, or you know, it's written very heavy, like. You know, not everybody can read that. Hey, hey, I so, can read Armenian um, pretty well. No, I, I can too, but it's, you know, it's, it's not, not the same. Common. It's, it's not, not common. common. I yeah. won't, yeah, I yeah. won't, if, yeah. if I were to buy 10 books, I wouldn't yeah. doubt it if one of, only one of them was in Armenian, right? Yeah. Like, that's yeah. just the way it is. Yeah. But uh, continuing, so, um, within relatively recent history, one wing of the Haikazuni, House of Haik dynasty, became known as the Orontids, or Yevandunis, named after the Orontas the first. Um, who actually was um, who ruled yeah, from five a short reign? Yeah, short Very reign, short five eighty to five seventy BC is yeah. ten years. Um, the Haikazuni oriented dynasty had many prominent kings who, within Armenian history and academic textbooks, have not properly been assessed. In fact, there is much to be said for the exceptional oriented leaders and the historic events that took place during their lifetimes. Several historians gave us valuable primary sources about the lives of Armenian kings between the 6th and 3rd century BC. These include Orontes I, Tigranes I, or actually it's Tigranes I Orontid, Orontes II, Orontes III, Ardoates, Sames, Arsames, Orontes IV, and other monarchs. Each one of them had a valuable input in forging Armenian history. However, traditionally Armenian history has in particular heaped praise and glorified the deeds of Tigranes I Orented. Mofses Horonanti considered Tigranes I Orented to be the third most important Armenian sovereign based on the overall measure of the accomplishments of Ahikazuni kings. Well, they were significant people during yeah. a very significant time. It yeah. seems like there's a lot of history during this time, uh, you know, first century to fifth, well, fifth or sixth century bc right? from sixth to third century bc you're talking or about three i'm sorry let me say yeah. it the other way around yeah. from the fifth sixth century bc to about the first century bc and there was a lot of rulers a lot of kings yeah. and a lot of um peoples and and civilizations in that area yeah. right um and the fact that most of the not in his writings has high praise for every single one of them not one of them was considered you know eh, whatever he was king yeah and they yeah. just mentioned his name in the history books and that's it yeah right yeah yeah um but then when Tigran the first is kind of raised above all with all the kings that we've had in our history yeah i'm well close to above all um it's pretty significant we should do an episode on him we will if we can, if we can find more information about yeah. him um i mean Look, again, we've talked about this many times. Yeah, we talked about dynasties and things like that. Eventually, we're going to go and dissect those oh, dynasties. Oh, yeah, we have and, to. And, you know, yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah. But hopefully, we'll have more information and do an episode on him. Speaking of Tigranes I, he lived in the 6th century BC and was one of the leading historical figures of his era. Let's briefly look at the primary sources about the reign of Tigranes I of Orontid. As was noted, according to Khorinazi, Tigranes I Orontid was the son of Orontes I. The Greek historian Xenophon 
um, circa 430 to 354 BC, yeah. mentions that Tigranes's father, without giving the latter's name, fought with the Median king Cyaxares, circa 625, 585 BC, and subsequently suffered a defeat and agreed to pay tribute. After a certain period, Orontes I organized an uprising against Cyaxares, if I'm saying that correctly, correct me if I'm wrong. I wouldn't be able to read it any other way. <laughs> yeah, it's spelled C-Y-A-X-A-R-E-S. So I'm just saying Cyaxarus or Cyaxarus, whatever. Yeah. Which failed due to a shrewd plot organized by the Persian king Cyrus the Great. If anybody knows their history well enough, we all yeah. know we all know and have heard of Cyrus the Great. A trial of Orontes I took place in which the Armenian king clearly outlined the reason of his uprising. And I quote, he said, I strived for freedom since I knew it was for the best and that my sons and I are free. The king who strived for freedom and independence for himself had two sons, Tigranes and Sabaris. The eldest son, Tigranes, was the pupil of a renowned philosopher and was known for his wisdom and talent. Tigranes was destined to be the king who would lead the kingdom of Armenia to a new revival. Yeah. yeah. And um, we've, we've got more from Khorenazi yeah. as you are about to embark yeah. on. So Khorenazi, uh, and again, I quote, He became a leader amongst men and by showing bravery, he glorified our nation and we who had been under a yoke put into a position of subjugating others and demanding tribute from many. Men of the infantry became cavaliers. The slingers became skilled archers. Those with clubs were armed with swords and lances. The unarmed were now covered with armor and shields. When they were gathered in one place, the sight of the assembled with their weapons and their shining rays of their armor were sufficient to appall and despair the enemy. You know, it, we've heard this before about how they took normal people mm -hmm. and armed them trained them and they i guess call it moving moving them up in ranks yeah right and everybody that was of some sort of ilk was moved up and given authority of some sort during these um enlightenments if yeah. you want it, to call it, it, or periods of, of people per right? periods of enlightenment yeah. right i mean he even says like you know the ones who weren't armed you know uh it's gathering of the people it's one of those times where it's you know wartime right so he continues these and many other things like these brought these curly, tippet blonde, Tigranes oriented, handsome, with a rosy complexion, strong legged, with splendid feet, slender and broad shoulders, modest in eating and drinking, restrained during feasts, about whom our ancestor sang with the leer and said that he was also moderate in the pleasures of the flesh, he was full of wisdom and eloquence, containing all qualities needed for a man he was just and fair weighing all of the cases and characters without any partiality he did not envy the preeminent and did not overlook the humble but rather tried to spread upon all the mantle of his care more powerful words from Moses what did not say yeah according to Xenophon Tigranes had close ties with the Persian king Cyrus II the Great with whom he had been hunting from the days of adolescence later on between 553 to 550 BC, when Cyrus revolted against Media, Tigranes became his ally. The father of Armenian history tells us that initially Tigranes was an ally of Astyages, and he had wed his sister Tigranuhi with the Median sovereign. Later on, when it became clear that Astyages was using Tigranuhi in various political intrigues, Tigranes rose up against Media, allying himself with Cyrus. As we noted, Cyrus had rebelled against the Median domination and wanted to topple the kingdom. A long and bitter war was looming on the horizon. Dun, dun, dun. Yeah. You got your sister involved. Oh, man. You don't mess with an Armenian sister. That is death. Sister. That is death. You don't mess with an Armenian sister. Nope. Nope. Lesson learned. And Melfsus Horonazi actually touches on this, as I'm about to uh, mention. The Armenian king gathered the army from the borders of Cappadocia, the best of Iberia and Albania, and lesser Armenia, and marched with all his might towards Media. 
the danger forced Astyagis to fight the Haikazuni with a large force. The fight lasted for five months, and no decisive and quick action was taken since Tigranes was worried about his beloved sister Tigranui. He wanted to find a solution so Tigranui could find a means of escape. When this was accomplished, the time of battle approached. Can you imagine, like, you know, the, the fear and, and how he had to, pers like, you know, kind of come up with the plan in the perfect way? The, the plan is icy red. If I had a sister, which I, I don't. know, but you also got to worry about her, <laughs> you know, you got to worry about her well-being. Sure. So, you but, know, what was going through his mind? How does he do this? You know? Yeah, um, sure. You, you know, got to be five months. You got to be tactical about it. But yeah. again, I see red. Yeah, I see red. Yep. As he continues on, during the battle, Tigranes, like water, split Ostiagas' iron armor. The tip of his lance went through his body, and when he drew back, Half of his lungs came out with the weapon. The combat was superb, for each side faced each other, and no one turned their backs, and the battle went on for many hours until the death of Astyagas put an end to it. Yeah. So there's your cap, buddy. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, you're talking about, you know, the way he describes it, the splitting the armor, you know, uh, went through his body and basically... To his lungs. So does this does yeah. this not qualify this episode as PG thirteen? No, it's fine. We're describing <laughs> what happened. You know. These are in the words of yeah. Motha Swaranazi. Yeah. So, Swaranazi in this passage makes an important note regarding the borders of the realm of Tigranes the First of Orontid. Um, it's not just about the battle. There's important dialogue that gets dissected as we're about to get into. Yeah. Um, that kind of proves this what happened and the the alliance between yeah. Tigranes and Cyrus right yeah. we're going to get into that in a second yeah. the Armenian king raises his army from the territory of greater and lesser Armenia Cappadocia Iberia and Albania being a part of this now Albania we have to say this again not the Albania that we know of no as yeah. a country that used to be a part of the Yugoslav state they, it, they used to be a people that were basically located in um, the, more or less what is now kind of like the eastern, south southeastern part of Georgia. Yeah. And like the northern well, part of uh, Azerbaijan. Yeah. I mean, by now we've mentioned this so many times yeah, in other just, episodes. Just in but, case, yeah. you know, you want to reiterate Albanian, because it's yeah. literally spelled the same, Albania. Yeah. According to traditional Armenian history, a war that lasted for five months finally ended when Astyagis was killed by Tigranes, as we mentioned earlier during a single combat. Other sources note that Astyagis was captured by Cyrus, not killed by Tigranes, who had already begun an insurgency against the former in 553 BC, as we've mentioned before. Yeah. Whatever Astyagis's end might have been, it is beyond a shadow of a doubt that Tigranes played a critical role in his defeat. Cyrus was able to establish the Achaemenid Empire, with the help of his chief ally, Tigranes the First of Orontid. Yeah, yeah. But you know, when they're talking about, I mean, what are the sources? That's the thing. It doesn't really mention. Like, no, it doesn't. It doesn't. But still, you, you know, hence why we talked about Ervan Duni and its connection or disconnection to yeah. the Persian lore, if you yeah. will. Right. Mm -hmm. This just further proves and moves into something deeper with the alliance that was formed as the Ervanduni family began to grow and move on over, over the years. Yeah. And the alliances that they formed with the eventual Akamanid Empire. Yeah. Right? With, against other forces. And, and you're gonna, you're, there's even further proof yeah. from, from, you know, Xenophon, as we, me we, we, we mentioned him earlier, that you're gonna talk about, um, yeah that this was an actual alliance yeah yeah and and Horenazi, you know uh, uh kind of affirms that cyrus and tigranes were comrades in arms yeah you know yes along um, with xenophon yeah however for a long time there was an assumption that the primary sources of the 6th and 5th century bc only included information on cyrus and did not mention armenia and its sovereign tigranes the first oriented not true According to the contemporary written sources of the period, after the establishment of the Achaemenid Empire, Lydia in Asia Minor 
Babylon, and Egypt established a powerful alliance against Cyrus the Great. In 546 BC, the Achaemenid Emperor was able to defeat Ladea and in 538 BC conquered Babylon. In order to reach Asia Minor, Cyrus had to cross Armenia. Therefore, it was falsely assumed that between 550 to 546 BC, on his way to Ladea, he had conquered Armenia. Of course, on one hand, Cyrus indeed had to cross Armenia. To the south of Armenia was a hostile Babylon. However, on the other hand, it was very important to point out that the hypothetical conquest of Armenia, or Urartu, or any of the other names used in Armenian that, you know, in written sources, is completely absent from records. Yes, sir, you know? it is. And in fact, one of the names used for Armenia from the 3rd millennium BC onward was Kutium. Kuti or Kutium. Kutium. Yeah, yeah. yes, yes. It's we've, actually we've... Kutium. So, yes. Yeah. Which in 8th century BC was used as a synonym for Urartu Armenia. Not coincidentally, we find that the primary source of the 6th century BC that the chief ally, Cyrus's state, is the country of Kuti of Armenia. There it is. Yeah. Bazinga. There it is. <laughs> I mean, seriously. I haven't heard that in a while. I know. I, yeah, actually, no. I had a friend say that to me the other day. It's fresh in my memory. But again, it, it's like proof upon proof upon proof upon proof. Yeah. Right? Um, too many connections. Too, way, way too many connected The evidence dots. is there. The evidence is there. Way you know? too many dots being connected. Yeah. Um, to further, you know have more proof of the alliance and uh you know which corresponds from both uh xenophone and hore nazi yeah um I, I almost feel like we're like you know we're in a court case yeah just like <laughs> we have more evidence your honor <laughs> next witness please <laughs> there are no further witnesses the defense rests you can't handle the truth <laughs> you can't handle the truth um anyway enough of goofing off um furthermore uh, Xenophon and uh, Horenazi. The contemporary written inscriptions tell us that the king of Kuti, as we mentioned earlier, or Kutium, led the allied forces and defeated Babylon in 538 BC. I know we've mentioned that date a few times. After the victory, the Kutian king was proclaimed as the viceroy of Babylon, the second man in charge of the Achaemenid Empire. And according to his allied status, maintained complete independence of his own nation. Therefore, it's quite obvious that the assumption that Cyrus, between 550 and 546 BC, had, quote-unquote, conquered Armenia, is absolutely false. Yep. Because we've talked about what Tigran yeah, the he first, was... what, what he eventually became because of that alliance. We yeah. mentioned it earlier, but now here you have further evidence that it was, in fact, True. I mean, if you look at, like you said, if you talk, if you go to court and you look at over the evidence, you know, Armenia was a key ally yeah. of of Cyrus, yes. which you know, he was able to, you know, uh, when he marched to Ladia, uh, you know, was through the territory, yep. but because of the fact that they were allies, mm -hmm. right? Yep, so, absolutely. Yeah. That would have never happened. Are you kidding me? You're not going to walk through my land if you're my enemy or yeah. somebody I don't like. Nope. Not happening. Figure it out, buddy. Yeah. Right? Again, Horanazi. He was the most powerful, wisest, and bravest amongst our kings. He helped Cyrus topple the rule of the Medes. He defeated the Greeks and held them in conquest for a long time, extending our borders to their ancient boundaries. He was envied by all of his contemporaries, and to those of us who lived after him, both he and his era became desired. As we were talking about before, it's not just about what Horenazi describes in his passages. Yeah. There is also some of the descriptions. You can't just look into a paragraph or paragraphs as like, oh, wow, what an amazing story. There's clues there. Of course. Yeah. Right? And this You got to read between the lines. Absolutely. Yeah. And this passage that I just read contains two very important accounts about the conquest of the Greeks and about extending our borders to their ancient boundaries. Mm -hmm. Tigranes I of Orontid ruled the Greek portions of Asia Minor after he was made the viceroy of the Achaemenid Empire. Which the, was in Babylon. Which was in Babylon. Yeah. 
the passage about ancient boundaries also mentions Cappadocia, which we all know where it is geographically. Yeah. In this regard, we cannot overlook the account of Faustus Buzand about a letter that the Armenian king Pop Ars of Artashes from 370 to 374 BC sent to the Byzantine Eastern Roman Empire. And it reads, Afterwards, he sent emissaries to the Greek king that Caesarea, along with ten other cities, is ours. Give them back. The city of Udha has also been built by our ancestors. Therefore, if you do not want any hostility, return them. Otherwise, we shall fight a great war. Well, you know, can you imagine, like, you know, receiving a letter like that <laughs> from another powerful king? Um, it's not the I, letter I, you want to get in the morning no, when you wake up. No, no, you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. You're like one of your servants shows yeah. up while you're like eating grapes and you're hanging out with like women and whatever, <laughs> whatever the case. Like, just imagine this, and like, and you're being fanned by those large yeah. feathers, and, and there's some sire. There's a message for and you, and there's somebody playing a harp and. <laughs> Some, I don't some, think they were playing harps at that time. Whatever. It just let's let's just use our imagination. Okay. Movies, Hollywood, film, whatever, right? Yeah. But yes, I'm sure. Yeah, harps didn't exist. Well, they might have had some sort of instrument, something. I'm sure they did, yeah. but whatever. Not <laughs> whatever. Anyway, All moving right. on. Moving on. So Mofsis Khorinati described Tigranes oriented as mighty, renowned, and victorious amongst the great kings. As early as a few decades ago. We still don't know from the other primary sources that he greatly expanded the borders of Armenia and was the second in command to the Achaemenid Empire. Because of the lack of information, it was wrongly assumed that the father of Armenian history had incorrectly put together information about the character and his deeds of the much later Artashes Tigranes II, the Great, who ruled from 95 to 55 BC, with that of the Tigranes I oriented. However, the fact that we now have at our disposal show that this is an unfounded point of view and that Tigranes Oriented was not confused with the renowned Artashes king. So, you know, that's what he's... A lot of people, because of the name, obviously, you know, yeah, there's been so many, you know, kings and, and you know, with the same names. But, and that's the thing. Even when, when you know, we're doing research, I didn't know much about Tigranes the first, you know? Um... I know when we were looking into the Tigran series that we did, yeah. um, the name popped up, at least on my end, with some of the re so my end of research that I was doing. I didn't really look into it, but you start to understand that obviously there were predecessors who had the same name, yeah. right, or bore or bear or bore the same name. Yeah. Excuse my grammatical error if I did one, um, but we do understand that. And it's, and it's easy for a lot of us to mistake or make a mistake into understanding which Tigran we're talking about. Are we talking about Tigran the Great or are we talking about Tigran Yervanduni? Yeah. Right? Um, and the time periods don't match. It's, it's a, what, like we're talking about a good four centuries, five centuries. Yeah. You know, um, that's the first clue. However, just the name in and of itself for, for, for a layman might be easy to confuse yeah. as to which one we're talking about, yeah. right? Well, to kind of end it, um, Tigranes Oriented, whom Khorenazi for his valor list as the third most distinguished leader in Armenian history in the 6th century BC led Armenia to an apex of power. The great name of Tigranes as a powerful universal sovereign reflected throughout Armenian history there were no less than six Tigranes after the reign of the Viceroy of the Akamed Empire, the most outstanding of whom was the Artashes King of Kings, Tigran the Great. Whom we have spoken about. Yeah. I'm exactly. sure we'll probably talk about him a lot. You yeah. know? And we have a sculptor. He's a pretty he's a pretty popular guy. Yeah. He was a cool dude. He was a cool dude. Yeah. So um yeah. So, you know, again, going back to the whole it, it it sucks that you know even within our history because of a, a king like Tigran the Great who later on came in and and you know obviously did some great things and united you know, yeah. everybody. But that's you know when we mentioned this, a lot of people don't know the Armenian kingdom. You know they talk about the the uh, Tigran the Great, you know King of Kings, the yes. whole sea to sea, which, mm -hmm. you know. But there were kings who had bigger 
you know, empires, I mean, Armenian you know, kings. And, and well, one of them some, was Tigranes the first. Well, to you know? some extent, you know, you know, what's interesting with this research that we did, and I'm going to bring this up. It, you know how we talked about when we talked about the Urartian kingdom yeah. of, there wasn't really evidence, too much evidence of how they vanished. But when you look at the timelines, mm -hmm. there wasn't much of a gap yeah. of when they quote unquote disappeared or vanished or whatever you want to call it. Like I'm being honest here. Yeah. And then this time period, which was in the mid sixth century, five fifties, five forties, as we've mentioned some dates here. Yeah. It makes you wonder. It makes you think, at least it did with me, where what happened to the Urartian dynasty or the kingdom? What did they how did they scatter? Where did they scatter? Where did they end up? And yeah. then the Yerevan Dunis sprouted upon yeah. or sprouted up. Yeah. Right. With the Akamanid, and we talked about it during that episode as well, how the Akamanids to, you know, grew in this time period. Yeah. Now we see the connection and it makes you think, yeah, what happened? How did it happen? Who we don't have, I don't have evidence, at least not yet. Yeah. We haven't covered something that maybe may point to this, but it really made my brain crank about the dates because yeah. I started tying it into what we had talked about. What was it? The second episode? Yeah. Yeah. The Urartu right? kingdom. Yeah. And it starts making you think about these things. Yeah, of course. I mean, I, I'm, I'm sure historians are probably like, oh my God, we got to figure this out. Yeah. But even, even us or anybody listening, it, you know, who, who pays attention to some of these dates and, and, and the timelines, makes you wonder it wasn't that short of it was a very short time span as to when the urartians disappeared yeah. or vanished well, they, they didn't or disappear dispersed, yeah dispersed you know? or whatever you want to call it yeah to this time period we're talking about yeah yeah well i mean you know like you said the word i don't it's not disappear but you know um just like with any um uh, any empire or imagine like if you were you know um, you were conquered, you know, when they conquer you, they don't kill everybody, you know, you just, sure. you know, no, they, no, yeah, they conquer, they yeah, rule. They don't wipe you out. They, yeah, they don't wipe you out. So I'm sure there was, you know, the resistance that spread and slowly, and, and one of those could have been the, you know, oh, the yeah, Orantis, yeah, it, it, it was a family, right? It's a family name, right? The Edvanduni. So, mm -hmm. and and I'm sure it, coming from the connection of the Nairi Confederation, right? Yes. So you have all these warriors, it's in their blood, you know? They might have lost. It's like one of those things where, okay, we lost this time, but we're going to band together. And and they did and, something, and, right, and, to and, be able to form this and, new And to kingdom. what you just said about banding together, when you look, when we jump forward, what, three, four centuries mm -hmm. of the time of Tigran the Great, yeah, right? What was one of the major achievements that he made with his expansion of Greater Armenia was he brought different Unity, bands different, yeah. of Armenians together. Yep. Yep. They didn't just happened to be placed there like a video game yeah they were there they were there for centuries they just maybe weren't under armenian rule they weren't under what we would call armenia it, yeah, yeah it could have or, been tribes it could yeah. have been just like and confederations and, so and that's that. where that's something that maybe developed over centuries and this is where interestingly enough you kind of start tying things together yeah we we've kind of jumped timelines you know we covered yeah. some things earlier than maybe yeah uh, we maybe we should have but now kind of diving back into the progression of the kingdoms, you start understanding and tying things in, like you're connecting dots, yeah. you're connecting dots. And that's why I'm asking that question is like, what happened to those people? Yeah. Right. But then four centuries later, you have Tigran the Great come, come in and, hey, we need to get together. We yeah. need to go conquer some lands. Yeah. You know, we need to do some damage. Yeah. Right? Oh, we, I mean, you know, for sure, we had some amazing kings and great people, and uh, they did some amazing things. But um, that's pretty much it for this uh, topic, this episode. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Hope we uh, give you some great information from our research. And um, let's see. Uh, next episode, December 9th. Yeah. We are going to be live on live. YouTube and Facebook, and our guest is going to be Rach Kozibeokian, who we mentioned in uh, the previous episode. Um, he is the president of the Armenian Rug Society. He also himself, he weaves 
rugs and um and we're gonna actually have the show live from his studio and we're gonna be discussing the history of armenian rugs and rug making going all the way back to i think he said which century like god i don't know yeah he, he was he was full of amazing stories yeah, man I I, i'm sorry i don't remember but it, it I goes i could way way back that, yeah i could have stayed at that guy's for house forever but um the interesting thing that he brought up and i so and I, you and i both agreed with this when we were having the conversation with him you know when we talk about history you know history is written by the powerful people mm -hmm. right of, of any the race, winners any the winners doesn't yeah. the winners uh, the, the powerful people they always yeah. wrote the history yeah winners or losers it doesn't matter like any anybody we're gonna get a little bit of insight of what regular folk people's lives were like yep. based off of the common people the common people and this was like rug making and i don't want to give away too much yeah. and when you know let's let hadach flow with it yeah we're gonna get an understanding of what the common people lived like and and did maybe for the nobility yeah. maybe not for the nobility but you know everything we talk about is usually about kings queens dynasties uh conquers conquests whatever the case is this is a little bit different yeah and i'm sure we're gonna do a lot more episodes like this you know that kind of talk about the common things about our history not so royal not so aristocratic yeah right and i think it's fascinating to hear that side of things of course of and, course. and if for if with any culture yeah. and that's our goal is, is is you know besides us talking about and doing research and reading about these uh great men and and you know our history we want to bring these type of uh people who have this experience from a different point of view of our history yeah. you yeah. know and and i i think it's going to be an amazing episode so again everyone this is next thursday december 9th 7 p.m pacific coast standard time live on youtube and facebook on youtube search for med Hedosnet podcast subscribe hit that notification bell so when we go live you'll get notified um same thing on facebook med Hedosnet. find us you know hit we're that, gonna spam you yeah hit that like button so that way you know you get notified when we get uh, we, when we go live doesn't matter which platform you you join us and you can ask us you can ask us questions directly you can ask questions to Hadach. we're gonna do uh some q a so we want to have a decent audience. So please, please, please join us. Um, and I think it's going to be a great I'm looking, show. I'm, I've yeah. been looking forward to that show. I really yeah. have been. And yeah. we, we, when we posted, we've got a, a, actually a pretty overwhelming response from people. Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh, we yeah. did. Well, which is which is great to know that people know about him. Yeah. It's well, he has fantastic. a great following yeah. as well. Yeah. So uh, it's really, we're, really we're, good to know. Yeah, we're really excited. So again, um, don't miss that episode. And. Um, also, you know, we, uh, again, we mentioned this last time. So Tigran, not Tigran, sorry. The Vartan sculpture <laughs> is shipping uh, and we're catching up to everybody. And by the way, uh, people, please, I know everybody emails us. When is my guys, we're, we're doing our best. You know, we yeah, mentioned it. We, we really get, are guys. Yeah. It's not, it's not easy. Yeah. These things take a long time. They're not. And you know. we get them in batches. As those batches come, we ship them out. It's like, you know, it's a process. So please be patient. Um, and we did announce that the Tigran uh, sculpture will be be remade in marble. And in that, marble. Yeah, and that is on pre-order as well. So, uh, you know, if you didn't get one of the Tigran, the original, go ahead and order it. And we will be sending the marble version to all the people who had the original. That's yes, something we're going we to do be. as well yes. for you. So we will, again, re we will replace it. Well, it's not a replacement, or but you know, we want it. it we gift. just felt like, yeah, it's a gift and we felt like it's not fair. Yes. You know, and the people who support us from day one, we are thankful. So, you know, it's not right for from now on, whoever, you know, is getting is going to get the marble. And no, yeah. no, no, yeah. we don't do that. Yeah. We don't want to be, like we don't said, be those guys. Yeah. For us, it's not about profit. But uh, speaking of profit and proceeds, you know, again, we do uh, donate um a portion of it to miasin.org we will be doing a payout middle of this month uh before the year end so please get those orders in so we can help this great organization as well um um Ashken sculpture wow that I mean you know 
It's doing great. So yeah, it's doing well. hey, it's one of our first Christian Queens people. You know, our you got to respect our, our, our women, man. Our, our great historical women. Uh, Armenian women are Armenian the most, women rock. Not the, just that. They're the best. Yeah, Armenian women, they're, 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 you know, their history, the, the strength they have. Um, you know, and this is not a knock on into the culture, but, you know, obviously we're Armenian. So Armenian women are the most beautiful, uh, you know, they have an hospitable. amazing soul. Hospitable. The, the, the mother, that motherly thing they have is just unbelievable. It's all about family, the children, their husbands taking care of them. Respect your wives, your women, your girlfriends. Doesn't matter. Um, and, you know, support them. Maybe give them a gift. Get Ashkin, you know. <laughs> so, um, and if you want to support us on uh, patreon.com slash medhedosned, we appreciate that. Uh, follow us on Instagram, which is at medhedosned, Facebook, YouTube. Just type in medhedosned podcast. We will, uh, you'll find us. Um, and that's pretty much it for this show. Anything you want to add, Mike? No. No? No. That's it? No? Yeah, that's it. You look sad. You want I, to go home? No. No? I don't want to go home. All right. <laughs> should we keep talking about something else? No, I think we should end it. Should we just talk about next week's episode? Uh, no. No. Okay. No. no. See? Oh, yeah. There we go. That's so, a wrap. Um, yeah, that's a wrap. As we always say, respect one another, love one another, and until the next episode, take care. <laughs>